Hello, dear friends. Miss Mezzi, I hope you had a wonderful week. Uh, today we're going to pick up with uh, Lecture 4 and Dr. Ironside's Lectures on the Book of Acts. It's going to deal with Peter's Sermon on Pentecost. And it's going to be uh, Acts 22, 22 through 36. Okay, so we're going to begin by reading the text, the scripture. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved among of a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is not, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell this that is in Hades the unseen world neither wilt thou suffer, suffer thine holy one to see corruption that thou let's see, thou hast made known to me the ways of, the ways of life thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his, the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, to sit on his throne. He seeing this before, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, wherefore, whereof we all are witness, are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth uh, which ye know, which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heavens, into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same, that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that is Acts 2, verse 22 through 36. And Dr. Ironside goes on to start his commentary with this. He says, I suppose this sermon which the Apostle Peter preached in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost immediately after the coming of the Holy Spirit as the comforter to indwell believers and to baptize them into one body is the most widely used sermon ever preached. We shall see in our next, me in our next message some results of it, but it does not hurt to anticipate, it does not hurt us to anticipate for we, for we know from Scripture the results were 3,000 souls turned to the Lord. What was the character of, the ser of this sermon and what was there in it that so appealed to the people? Of course, in trying to answer this, we need to remember that the circumstances were most remarkable. The Lord Jesus Christ had fulfilled three and a half years of his wonderful ministry in the land of Israel. By his many miracles, he had manifested his messianic power and his, char and his character showed that he was the Son of God. Now that is going to be the first 
point that I want you to remember is that by, let's see, wonderful ministry, is that the Lord Jesus Christ had fulfilled three years, three and a half, let's see, three and a half years of his wonderful ministry in the land of Israel. By his many miracles, he had his messianic power he had manifested his messianic power and his character showed that he was the son of god and this statement the son of god is a statement people say uh, for example the jehovah's witnesses will say oh well jesus was the son of god but what you have to understand is that to be the son of god is to be god okay that's not a statement of, oh, well, Jesus is just the Son of God. Is Jesus is just the Son of God. No, that is a statement of Jesus is God. He is directly from God's being. He is part of Him. All right? Uh, this statement, the Son of God, if Jesus was not the Son of God, the statement of Him being the Son of God would be blasphemy. Okay? That's how serious this statement is so whenever you see the word of God it calls Jesus the son of God remember that that is a very powerful and absolute statement okay a number believed on him and a great many rejected him and by those who had rejected him he had been crucified three days later he rose again from the tomb appeared to certain select persons again and again for a period of 40 days and then ascended into heaven after which the spirit himself he the spirit himself came on the day of pentecost and predicted and in fulfillment of old testament prophecy there were gathered at jerusalem a vast throng of people from all different countries to which the Jews had been dispersed during the centuries. They had come to keep the feasts at Jerusalem, the first Passover, and then Pentecost. And as they listened to this message, it came home to their consciences with, pe with peculiar power. Never again will there be such circumstances, and that is one reason we can never expect to see a duplicate of the of that power or ever or even to see a single sermon used as that one was used but as we consider the content of it it will at least suggest to us a t the type of sermon that god can use to conv convert sinners the first thing is simplicity not a word was uttered that day that a child of adolescence of adolescent age could not have understood so the first the first thing he notices about this state about this sermon is it is it is simple it's plain language okay there was not a word that day that was spoken that a child could not understand okay that an adolescent could not understand Peter did not need someone to explain his words. His hearers did not need to go away to study the dictionary. I remember hearing a good preacher in Birmingham, Alabama, and it happened that the colored ministers had asked permission to sit in the balcony to hear the sermon and were graciously accorded this privilege. It did not seem very gracious to me, but that is the way let's see but that is the way they look at it down there and this is this is many many years ago of course and of course dr ironside is is not agreeing with that type of treatment as these colored brethren were descending the stairs at the close one of them was asked well how did you enjoy the sermon today well, he said, he sure did speak fine words. I'm going home now to see if I can find out what they all meant. I thought, what a pity. 
if only the preacher had clothed his message in such a manner that the simplest and most illiterate could understand. Peter used simplicity. Now that, of course, that's a touchy topic today, but there's people of all, all colors who, who just do not have the same level of learning, okay, that others do. And as pastors and people of the word, pastors, ministers, preachers, evangelists, need to try to speak to reach their audience. They need to, they need to speak in plain English that everyone can understand. If you use polysyllabic legal babble, then you're, you're not doing anyone any good if they can't understand what you're saying. The Spirit of God is not... I mean, how can the Spirit of God work with them? That's not to say that the Spirit of God can't do anything. But all I'm saying is... Take yourself take yourself out of the way when you're explaining the gospel. Alright? And all of this, you know... Trying to make things sound more complicated than they are... That comes of pride. Okay? But let's continue. Uh... In the second place, Peter's sermon was centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's another part to remember about this message that Peter preached. His sermon was centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, okay. He held up Christ crucified and risen, and that is the message God has promised to bless. He has sent his servants into the world to preach the gospel, the good news about his son. Peter did not argue. He did not go into abstruse theological problems. He told them about the death, the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he told of that, it went, it went home to the hearts of, of his hearers with tremendously convicting power. I'm afraid we forget. It's 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 in the plain simple story that reach it is the same plain simple story that reaches the people and brings them to the knowledge of salvation. We sometimes sing sing I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love and yet we spend so much time about uh, spend so much time about other things and so little time on that wondrous story I shouldn't be surprised if our hearers didn't feel like reminding us us of that other hymn tell me the tell me the story often f all right let me see try to sing this uh, tell me the stories often, often, for I forgot so soon. The elder dew of morning has passed away at noon. That is what the world needs. That is what men and women are crying for. And so we want to see how Peter presented it at Pentecost and want to ask God to bless it as we present it here. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. You see, hear these words. You see, Christ came in the beginning, not to the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And while the disciples were to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, he distinctly said... They must being at Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was at was the most guilty city on the face of the earth at the time. Jerusalem had had the greatest privilege, and yet it crucified the Son of God. So the message was to the very people who had rejected Christ, the nation of Israel. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, Jesus of Nazareth. That speaks of his humanity. It speaks of his lowliness, of his character. He who is over all, God blessed forever. 
stooped to become a carpenter of Nazareth. So, he who is over all, God blessed forever, stooped to become a carpenter of Nazareth. That's going to be point four. That is an extremely powerful point. Extremely powerful. It's amazing how God, God works in ways that we, quite frankly, wouldn't, wouldn't, in ways that we wouldn't work if we could work. All right. And that's because of his vast knowledge and, well, I say vast, um, omniscience. And, and he's all wise. Uh, I listened the other night to that great Japanese evangelist, Kagawa, and speaking of many blessings of the gospel brought to the Japanese. He said, among other things, the gospel has taught the people of Japan, even so, even those who have rejected its saving message. The dignity of labor of the laboring man before the gospel became before the gospel came the laboring man was looking down upon the absolute with absolute contempt but when Christian missionaries came to tell the story of the Son of God who became a carpenter who shed his blood upon the cross for our sins it changed the whole conception of the of people toward the laboring class that has been true over all the, that has been true all over the world the laboring people were hardly more than slaves when Jesus came and now there is practically no actual slavery left in any civilized land some are enslaved by laws cruel and ruthless but the arrival of the gospel changes completely the attitude toward those who toil and labor Jesus of Nazareth labored as a carpenter God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed and of the devil. Acts, see Acts 10.38 for that. Uh, Peter, in the beginning, does not rise any higher than that. He does not dwell on the deity of Christ. He tells them, Here was a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. In other words, Peter is telling them, this man is the Messiah. God had put his seal upon him. This was the one whom the prophets had proclaimed and of whom the psalmist had sung. And what have they done with him? Let me ask you this, let me ask you the question. What have you done with him? You know why he came, why he died. What have you done with him? Have you opened your heart to receive him? Have you trusted him as, as Savior? If not, you are as guilty, yes, in some respects even more guilty, than they in those days. What did they do? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Notice how two things come together here that often trouble thinkers among men. First, God's predeterminate counsel and wicked man's free will. Okay? Wicked man's free will. And God's predeterminate counsel. Okay. God had a predeter God had predetermined that his blessed son was to come into the world and give his life a ransom for sinners. Jesus came not to be ministered unto you, unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20 verse 28. But God had not predetermined that men should curse him, spit upon him, and heap every kind of indignity upon him. These things were of men's godless. Uh, these things were of men's godlessness, led on by Satan. 
Peter says God sent him. God knew all that would take place, but you are but you are responsible for your sins in that you laid hold of him and with your wicked hands crucified and slew him. When man would do his worst, God gives his best. Man showed the malevolence and iniquity of his heart. He cried, away with him, crucify him. And then the ruthless soldiers nailed him to the cross of shame, to that cross of shame. But when man had done all that, God said, this is my beloved son. Is this great? Is is the, is the great off? Is the great sin offering for the guilty, even for men rejecting him now? For the men who crucified him and put him upon the cross, his soul was made the offering for sin. By his death, redemption, by his death and redemption was produced which God offers freely to all men everywhere, regardless of race, color, creed, okay? God offers this to all men everywhere, and as a result of God's love for, for all people of any race, color, or creed, we should have that same love of any race, color, or creed. For the gospel is offered to them as well, and Jesus died for all of us, all, all humankind. All right? All uh, right. Which God offers freely to all men everywhere. In answer to what man did, we see God acting in power. So God, that's another point there. God offered freely to all men, and that is all humans everywhere. Okay? He offered this to everyone, not just a select few. All right. Is the uh, in answer to what man did, we see God acting in power, whom God hath raised up, having loosed pains, loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Death tried to hold him. But he was too powerful. <laughs> when sin had been atoned for and the sin question settled, it was righteousness on the part of God that demanded that his son be brought back again from, that, from the dead. And so in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the evidence of God's satisfaction with the work done. So it's, that's another point there. So it's in the, in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the evidence of God's satisfaction with the work done, which is, with his, which is Jesus' sacrificial work. Okay, six, that's point six. So the risen, crucified one is now set forth as the Savior of all who put their trust in him. Praise God. The Apostle Peter goes on, goes on to quote from three Psalms showing how the Old Testament scripture had opened up to him. Before his ascension, Jesus said, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, He shall take of mine and shall show it unto you John 16 verse 15 and so now guided by the illumination of the Holy Spirit Peter turns to passage Peter turns to passage after passage in the book of Psalm Psalms and shows how all were being fulfilled in Christ first he refers to Psalm 16 for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and that I should not be moved. Therefore my heart rejoiced, 
Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave. Leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now these words, you say, are expressed by David in the first person. When he wrote the 16th Psalm, one might have imagined, perhaps, those experiences were to be his own. But Peter shows it. It shows it was the Spirit of Christ speaking through David, leading him to write as he did. These things are not all true of David. David could not say, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer me to see corruption. David's soul was left in Hades, and his body did see corruption. But Peter says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. But he was a prophet, and as a prophet was looking forward to the Messiah's coming, therefore knowing that God had sworn with him an oath, an oath to him, that his son was to sit forever on the throne, Peter declares that it was, Je it was of Jesus God spake. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, and his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corrupt. Neither his flesh. Ne neither did. Neither did his flesh see corruption. It is very interesting to note, however, these Old Testament prophecies meet in the Lord Jesus Christ. Prophecies that never could have been, prophecies that uh, that never could have been fulfilled in anyone else, were all fulfilled in him. He walked in accordance with these beautiful words in Psalm 16. He could say, "I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is on my right hand, that I should not be moved." And as he moved toward the, to, and as he moved forward to death, even as he hung upon the cross, he could say, "My flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known unto me, thou hast made known to me the ways of life." The apostle Peter was moving on to the resurrection for the path of life lay through the grave and up to the throne of God mm, path of life wow and all this was spoken beforehand of our Lord Jesus Christ Peter says this Jesus hath God raised up therefore he the risen one being by by the right hand of God exalted and having received the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit understand what Peter is saying the man Christ Jesus is the is in his human body has gone up to heaven and has taken his seat at the right hand of God, of, Ma, of the majesty on high he is now the mediator God has given to him the Holy Ghost without measure that he might shed forth the Holy Spirit upon men here on earth. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which, we na which ye now see and hear. Would ye need evidence stronger to show to show you that Peter truly understood the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a mere man shedding forth the Holy Spirit in this way? The Holy Spirit himself is a person, a person of the Godhead. Jesus, God the Son, was commissioned by God the Father 
to give God the Holy Spirit to those who would believe to those who believe on him for David is not ascended into heaven into the heavens oh somebody says then David's soul is sleeping in the grave no that is not what he means David's body lies in the grave David is not yet ascended into heaven in his physical body but Christ Jesus has gone up into into the heavens in his glorified body David looking on by face speaks again in Psalm 110 the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool Peter says and it as it were my brethren the man who died on the cross was foreseen by David sitting at the right hand of God the Father waiting for the moment when all creation would be subject to him when all his foes will be made his footstools and this is his climax and upon this he bases his exhortations that I bring you today those of you who may be out of Christ therefore let all the house of Israel know let us stop there all right uh, Dr. Iron says, side says, let us stop there and think of the goodness of God. The house of Israel had rejected Jesus, had rejected Christ, and Jew and Gentile had united in the evil act of his crucifixion. Yet, so great is the love of God that he sent Israel this special, me this special message. They had been set aside as a nation. Jesus said some time before your house has left unto you desolate Matthew 23 38 they were set aside as a nation then but God was yearning after them still and he speaks in love therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ and the word for for Christ you know is simply the word for the Messiah God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Messiah and you notice you notice and you notice there is no pleading no begging no urging, no taking. And you notice, there is no pleading, no begging, no urging to take some stand. But the moment Peter comes to the conclusion, at once, there is a move among the people and a great response. And that response, if it please God, will occupy us in our next address. What is your response to it? God has exalted the man who died on the cross to his own right hand to be Prince and Savior and has made him Lord and Messiah. Have you trusted him and received him? But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll become God, of course that means that you'll be God's children you see uh, sons of God even to them that believe on his name and the the issue here is that you see God doesn't want anybody to go to hell but if you don't want God to be your father then the devil's gonna be your father and you're gonna end up going with you. everybody goes with their father when this whole thing shakes out Okay, so my advice to you is to choose the Lord Jesus Christ as your father. All right, instead of by default selecting the devil as your father. All right, now God bless you, dear friends. Miss Mezzi, hope you enjoyed this lesson. Uh, 
God bless you, and I hope you have a wonderful day.